Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bard Graduate, Graduate Center, Decorative Arts, Design, History, Material Culture. Uh, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that our building stands on the ancestral homelands of the Lenape Lenape people and uh, other indigenous peoples in the region. Um, this year is our 25th year. Uh, and I'm happy to say that our founder and director, Susan Weber, is here with us in the audience. I'm Catherine Whalen, Associate Professor here at Bard Graduate Center, and I co-convene this series with my colleagues Meredith Lynn and Ivan Gaskell. And this series is Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Raymond J. Horwitz Foundation Seminar in New York and American Material Culture. And we are very, very grateful to the Horwitzes for supporting um, this series uh, for many years now. Yeah, but we're still supporting it. <laughs> Should I say endowing? Endowing. Thank you for the historical correction. Uh, I'm really delighted to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Michelle Erickson. Uh, Michelle has a BFA from the College of William and Mary, is an independent ceramics art artist and scholar. She's internationally recognized for her work um, in which she's studied and revived uh, ceramic techniques um, uh, from colonial America primarily uh, and also abroad. Um, and she uses this work to reinvent uh, contemporary work, um, her own work, um, and where she's going to address some of the themes she's talking about tonight. Uh, her lecture tonight is excuse me, Making History, The Art and Politics of Clay. Uh, her work has um, really helped uh, reinvigorate uh, decorative arts collections here in, in the US uh, and abroad um, by showing the kinds of political connections that you can make using contemporary art um, in reference to these um, historical moments and historical techniques. Um, her pieces um, actually are the first examples of contemporary ceramic art acquired by Colonial Williamsburg, the New York H Historical Society, the Chipstown F Foundation, and other institutions. Um, her work is in the collections of many of these major museums, uh, including also the Museum of Arts and Design, the Seattle Art Museum, uh, the Potteries Museum at Stoke-on-Trent, and the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, Michelle has also lectured and demonstrated her work widely um, and has a very long list of exhibitions uh, to her credit. Um, and some of those she's gonna talk a little bit about tonight. Um, <clears throat> she's also published her scholarship in journals like um, <clears throat> Ceramics in America, and also has been written about extensively. Uh, she's designed and produced ceramics for many museums, institutions, and collectors. Um, she, so she's gonna show us some of the projects um, that she's worked on tonight. Um, and I'm, I'm adopting a no spoilers policy, and we're almost there. So please join me in welcoming Michelle Erickson. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Bard, for having me speak tonight. And thank you, Susan, for being here tonight. And to D Dean Miller, thanks for um, uh, inviting me to, to come and um, talk about a little bit about what I do and what it has to do with uh, the study of art and design and material culture. Full disclosure, I'm not a scholar. Uh, I'm just an artist, uh, a maker, and who makes things, little things out of clay. But little things out of clay can last for millennia. And so I think about um, that a lot in my work and the things that it's connected to and the practice that's connected to making things out of clay. So um, why clay? Uh, in my experience, uh, after uh, about 35 years in working in clay, uh, as a contemporary artist and um, a person who looks to a material culture of the past, and specifically ceramic material culture, I came to realize that clay and people are so interconnected. You know, anytime you, you uh, see even ancient figures in the ground, they often have pots surrounding them and pieces of clay. And there's a, a huge dialogue and discussion about craft and art and the distinctions between those things. And uh, I just wanted to sort of use these two images to uh, speak to that. I'm not going to 
get into that. That's above my pay grade. But I would say that um, somebody might argue that that's not a good example for craft because it was a sculpture. But I would say that that piece has a function in a culture that is lost to us has a meaning that we can only experience in our present moment, just as this, what we see as a painting, also had a function and uh, also is an act of ex human expression uh, and creativity. So Clay can tell you a lot about a person. The way that someone might handle a piece of clay, in fact, can tell you a lot about a person. And the way that an object is made can tell you a lot about the context and the culture and the place and time when it was made, and it can bring that into the present moment. Let's make sure. So I always like to get someone to sort of bring their hands to clay to know something about them. Gentle, Donald. <laughs> Slowly, okay. That's good. How much you want for your pot? Five hundred. Six hundred. Introducing Cozone.com, the place to find computer help and buy no what's right for you. Hey. Hey yourself. <laughs> Cozone.com. We can help. <laughs> Oops. So that's a that's a pretty um, <laughs> that's a pretty prescient ad. <laughs> uh, let me go back to my other clicker. Sorry. And you know, it, making uh, so the reverse engineering of artifacts of cer from ceramic history, and especially those that find themselves in a colonial American context, mostly archaeologically. Uh, has been a real um, substantive part of my um, practice as an artist. So I, I sort of use the, the methodologies that I uncover and also the, the, you know, the network of context that goes out from that to inform my work. And sometimes it really does matter to have the right um, skills for the job. And so uh, I was... <laughs> at the VNA uh, in 2012 and we made some videos and I just wanted to kind of show this video on making an 18th century agate ware pectin shell teapot. It's not that long, but uh, it will give you some idea of what's behind uh, some of this sort of reverse engineering of these practices. Oops, damn it. In this film, I'm going to recreate an 18th century agateware teapot in the V&A's collection. Agateware uses different colored clays to create a pattern that imitates agate stone. This particular type of laid agateware has to be press molded to maintain the pattern of the marbleized clay. To make the molds, it's necessary to investigate how the original model used for the molds was formed. My initial assumption is that it was sculpted to imitate a shell. I'll start by measuring the V&A's piece and increasing the scale taking account of the eventual shrinkage of the clay through drying and firing. I'm throwing a thick shape that can be marked, carved, and modeled into the main body of the teapot. I'll do the same for all the additional parts. The lid, the serpent spout, the dolphin handle, and the finial in the shape of a Chinese foo doll. The teapot has an oval form, so a leaf is cut out of the base and the sides are pushed together. I'm experimenting with how the form might have been originally made. After looking closely at the form of the original teapot, 
it seems that it may have been molded directly from a natural shell rather than being modeled. Following that insight, I'm cutting my thrown model in half to press into a mold from a natural shell. The shape, the size, and the number of loaves on the natural shell are very close to what I need for the teapot. I'm marking the cast shell with a compass so I can model it to recreate the exact shape I need. I've made plaster molds for each section of the teapot. Ornamental relief on the lid and the finial is carved directly into the plaster molds. A slab of colored clay needs to be created to press into the mold. This requires four different earthenwares. A manganese clay, a cobalt clay, an iron clay are layered with white earthenware to create the alternating layers. The layered slabs are turned into rolls and cut. The rolls are then assembled, alternating the colors and pounding into a solid block of clay. The block is sliced into layers and pressed into a thick slab between two sheets of paper to protect the patterning. A rolling pin is used to thin the slab. Based on my research, it became clear that the patterned slab of clay was sliced and then the slices alternated to create a new pattern. Carefully pressing the pattern slab into the shell teapot mold and trimming away the excess. I'm repeating that for the other parts. The edges are scored in preparation for joining the two halves of the mold together. The tool is used to seal the seams on the interior. Now that the clay is leather hard, I'm removing it from the mold. I'm going to clean the seams and assemble the sections to make the teapot. The clay is rolled into a tapered coil to make the handle. The handle has additional embellishment. An incised plaster sprig mold is used to create the eyes of the dolphin. A brass roulette makes the pattern on the dolphin's back. I'm piercing the holes that will let the tea flow from the body of the teapot into the spout. I'll now leave the pot to dry before bisque firing. After the bisque firing, the teapot is dipped in glaze, which temporarily covers the pattern and reveals the form of the shell. When the glaze firing is complete, the final colors are revealed. Here you can see my teapot on the right with the 18th century Staffordshire original on the left. Let's credit. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That looked like a lot of work. <laughs> Your aunt is an awesome videographer for the VNA.
So the communicate the 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 history of ceramics um, as a communicator is something that's really compelling to me, and I feel like this piece I think is in the British Museum um, communicates that very well, and and the coexistence of the human condition with material culture is something that I think is. Uh, gives ceramics the ability to actually convey those things from our most um, basic needs to our highest aspirations. So a chamber pot to a fine piece of sculptural art all has the ability to communicate. And so the creation myth, of course, uh, from in, you know, uses clay as the as the medium for the creation of man. And looking back at historical ceramics um, is something that is, for my, uh, for my approach, has been uh, primarily through the lens of colonial American archaeology and um, collections. But so that, that time period of um, probably the earliest first contact from late 16th century uh, through the, the 19th century is, is a period that I uh, look at, and when the East opens up to the West. Here you have um, uh, Hamada and Leach, you have Bernard Leach and Hoji Hamada, uh, ha <laughs> Hamada, excuse me, um, looking at some English um, jugs, and, and to me this picture is, is really telling because I feel like uh, Bernard Leach is, is seeing that object maybe for the first time through how inspiring it is to Hamada. And the, the, those two cultures, uh, looking at the objects of the other, uh, really brings those objects to life uh, for the individuals who they've been a part of their lives for so long. Um, I, I don't know, probably everybody in this audience knows who those two people are, yeah? Um, so, and... Yeah, okay. In the, in the 20th century, uh, late 20th century, now 21st century, two of uh, really the, the most um, compelling artists in the world and well-known in their own circles are um, Ai Weiwei here and Grayson Perry. And uh, again, that's East meets West. Grayson is uh, a British artist who is um, across, uh, I don't think he identifies as transgender, a cross-dressing uh, British. He started out with ceramics. Ai Weiwei um, started out with ceramics too. So two of really the um, the most active um, social, uh, on social commentary, active artists in the world are uh, started out with ceramics. And these are uh, each one of their pieces. So again, um, here, Grayson's appropriating basically the, the great uh, Chinese um, vase in the v &A and using it to communicate his, his story. And Ai Weiwei is taking a Han Dynasty um, storage vessel and emblazoning it with the iconography of the 21st century or 20th century. Uh, when I was at the V&A, I had a chance to study a lot of those objects firsthand. Uh, that's Alan Graves, who's the curator of contemporary there. And um, that same jug uh, was one of the pieces that I selected for the cases. You can uh, choose some things that you want to use for your inspiration. But it was a, a, an amazing opportunity to have that the, the uh, residency galleries actually in the ceramics galleries in the V&A. Um, but my, at that point, I, my, most of my exposure to ceramics from the past is from broken pieces. And this is just, I'm doing some mudlarking on the Thames where you can find all kinds of, uh, things. And that's just a little bit of Staffordshire slipware and probably a 17th century colander and all kinds of little bits and pieces that, um, can tell a huge story. But my experience with it came from uh, Jamestown, Virginia, in the Colonial Triangle of Virginia, and where a Wanli cup like this, uh, you know, 
1600 Wanli porcelain wine cup can be found in the context of a lot of objects like this, which have very sort of alien forms, unknown uses um, that are being dug up out of the ground, things that people have walked over for, you know, a few hundred years, and they resurface as, you know, unknowns, but they're just, they're so uh, intriguing. And what, what, what are they about? And what is the culture about that is using these things in their everyday life? But what's really compelling about Jamestown is that once you introduce this material into that mix of um, the juxtaposition of those objects, then you have a, a unique story in the world. And so this is um, one of the first contact period Virginia Indian pots that they've excavated, excavated there. And they have an exhibition up. For the first time, they have uh, Pocahontas on Earth, so they have a lot of the Native American um, material culture from that first contact period on display in the Arcarium at Jamestown Island. And this um, person who should probably be a national treasure, Daniel Firehawk Abbott, um, made everything in that photograph and including the clothing that he's wearing. And those arts are lost, you know, those arts are not, um, um, known, and they're very, it's very hard to come by people, um, indigenous people who have those practices. They're, they're trying uh, to really um, bring that back, especially, especially on the East Coast and, and those uh, tribes. They're really trying to uh, cultivate, recultivate uh, the culture through the making of things and, and the practice of all kinds of um, um, food ways and, and uh, farming and uh, fishing and all, you know, which have been really pretty much lost to time. So if you go to Jamestown and you see um, that exhibition Pocahontas on Earth, you will probably meet Daniel, uh, you might meet him doing demonstrations and, or talking about his culture at Jamestown because that is a, pl a place where he's able to, to do that. And I think that's, um, I don't know what I think about that. <laughs> but when I um, was working with that material for some years. I was contacted by the movie industry to create uh, some work for the a movie, The New World. And at that point, um, I've been working in these sort of practices and recreating that period, that specific period of things, um, not really most for to sell so much as um, to figure them out and then, and then sell the things that I might, that might come out. Uh, this is a 18th century Staffordshire slipware dish. It's a little later than that first contact period. And uh, this is part of uh, some work that I did for Ceramics in America. The first issue of it has uh, an article on English slipwares and uh, rediscovering some of the techniques of uh, early English slipware. And so this pomegranate dish I use because uh, it's uh, a very... Um, at the time that this is being made in Staffordshire, Staffordshire slipwares and the slip, the slipware, English slipwares seem to me to be really a more about um, their own cultural practice, and it's a very uh, unique to um, their methods and their uh, expression in clay. Uh, a lot of at that point, a lot of the um, Europe and, and Britain are trying to imitate Chinese porcelains, which are becoming desirable. But the slipwares really speak to that um, English culture. And I wanted to use that for this piece, Virginia, which was inspired by the work that I did um, while working on the set of uh, The New World. There was a lot of um, uh, Native American actors. They were all in their full dress, and they were, um, you know, sitting up next to the trailer, having their, their lunch from food services or whatever in full war paint. And I got sort of, um, I had been working on uh, this idea for this 
bust that kind of represents that first contact period and the and the the, the clash and the coming together of those two cultures. And so this is the war paint is the Union Jack. So this practice of slipwear in England captured the imagination of Bernard Leach again, and he did what's probably not one of his most famous pieces because it's considered to be a reproduction uh, of a Thomas Toff piece, which was a 17th century English slipwear potter. Uh, but I think it's one of his best pieces exactly for that reason. And um, I was commissioned to do a uh, a piece to be presented to Queen Elizabeth when she came to the 400th anniversary of um, the founding of Jamestown. And I wanted to kind of speak to that moment to uh, deal with the subject matter of uh, indigenous people of Virginia and, and, the, and the long arm that colonial, uh, colonialism has had on those people. And as well as commemorate that. So I often use uh, clay from a place. I used um, some, some clay from Jamestown Island itself to create the piece, uh, Terra Nova, which is a cover article written by Ivor Noel Hume, who's now um, gone, for Ceramics in America, I think 2008. So I have the, the Adam and Eve in, in the after the Debray or the John White watercolors of the Virginia Indians, and then I have the thistle and rose and the crown, sort of in the posture of the the, temp the snake and the temptation. Here's Grayson again, and I had an opportunity. I was invited to be the guest artist at the North Devon Festival of Pottery, um, and to make pieces. I made some things out of Jamestown clay that I took over to fire in a wood fire kiln there and then made some pieces out of their Fremington clay that they have in North Devon. So North Devon Scraffito, which goes on for hundreds of years. And there's a piece upstairs that's probably a 20th century version of that. Um, I was able to use that, make a piece in the, the Devon ball clay to slip it in. And um, I wanted to do a portrait jug and I decided to do um, portrait of, of the queen. So this is a portrait of Grace and Perry called Vanitas. And this is the, <laughs> the wood fire kiln. The guy in the bandana is actually Bernard Leach's grandson, Philip Leach. Um, John Edgler, who's written tons of books on um, English slipwear and a couple of really, really great potters and really good People, good artists, wood fire. This is all wood fired earthenware artists that, in that area. And there's a really um, substantial practice of that right now in that area. And this is the finished piece in a private collection. So a lot of my work is also influenced by different, um, you know, by prints and imagery, politics. And uh, I've been in sort of a uh, love affair with Hogarth for many, many years. One of the first pieces um, that I did uh, was this Midnight Modern Conversation back in, what year was that, Rob? Do you know? I don't know. Uh, maybe like 90, huh? Last century. <laughs> Last century, that's it. <laughs> and, um, and I wanted to uh, recreate um, that that piece in three dimensions. This is pretty large. It's um, not, maybe not as large as on there, but about this big. And because every person in that image, uh, you, I could connect to a contemporary <laughs> figure. Uh, but it also, uh, when you look at, at prints, and of course, there's so much material culture um, that is revealed in those things. And when you go to actually three, make those three in three dimension, it makes you forces you really to try to understand what those objects are, what they really were. Um, and, and they really are all something, because when you think about that, of course, this is the stuff that Hogarth in his time uh, saw and used every day. So they were not imaginary things. I mean, of course, he puts lots of uh, you know, imaginary imagery in there, but 
And these little figural groups um, and that were made in Staffordshire are, are similar in that. They have, they're telling you a lot about the social practices, the functional the functional uses for these things, uh, and something about how, how these scenes played out in the 18th century. So uh, another, another confession, boomer here. So this is at the beginning of the George Bush. <laughs> Well, not at the beginning. This is about the yellow cake uranium. And I use the format of those figural groups uh, to do um, Texas Tea Party, which was before the Tea Party, the new Tea Party came into existence. This was back in two, 2005. That, that term was not coined yet for that group of people. But um, so it's some various characters. Uh, Dick Cheney, they're all um, sort of having a real good time, having tea, Texas tea, and yellow cake. And that's GW and Condoleezza Rice there. <laughs> and a pectin shell teapot. You have to have that, the shell oil for these things. So um, I, had, I had been looking at this for a long time, and it, you know, uh, as you do sticking away some something that you know is going to be uh, an inspiration for something. This is uh, The Able Doctor. This is Paul Revere's engraving. Um, and, you know, I don't think I need to really describe <laughs> how harsh this scene is and, you know, the, all the various things that are implied here. There's, you know, on so many levels. But you have a general, you have a judge, you have... Uh, France and Spain, you have, um, uh, I forget who this guy is, uh, and you have Britannia sort of weeping, and you have this uh, terrible depiction of, of, of America as a um, native woman being, you know, abused every way they could possibly do it. And I realized that the composition of that piece um, reminded me of something, and sometime later, uh, I discovered what I think that is, and that it was uh, the lamentation. I used to pass this every day at the V&A in the sculpture hall, and the back of it is even better than the front. But this is um, a piece by Grayson Perry, who got into tapestries and, and does these incredible tapestries. Um, I mean, he, he designs them, I think. And um, I felt that, that his, uh, oh, I don't have the title, and I don't, I don't know what the title of this is. I'm sorry. Um, this piece uh, is that, um, that same imagery of the lamentation with, you know, a dying crack addict and all kinds of various iconography and imagery, the BP oil and the, and the uh, McDonald's sign and so forth. But I, I started to look, you know, into that. And, it, you know, really it's, um, it's pretty, you know, substantial that that's what's going on there. So that's a pretty brutal 18th century political satire, I would say. And, and uh, so I, it didn't, I didn't feel as bad when I <laughs> transformed that into... Um, this is an image that, so I use that and overlaid contemporary figures um, to create this image to make a transfer print, and that image is called The Party's Over. And so here you have um, Justice Roberts, you have Wayne LaPierre, you have John Boehner, who was then the Speaker of the House. You have Ken Cuccinelli, uh, who in Virginia was um, trying to enforce uh, a, a, Institute a law that was basically forcible sodomy on women to have a ultra, vaginal ultrasound if they wanted to get an abortion. And um, he is now in charge, uh, he is now um, overseeing uh, immigration, which is a scary prospect. Uh, Rand Paul and Mitch McConnell, who has a big role this week, I guess. Um, and this is uh, uh, that image in, uh, turned into a transfer print that's been applied to a porcelain shell edge ditch that I made 
I have applied this on period, uh, some transfer on period objects occasionally. Um, this one I did. This is another figure historically that I feel had some real resonance and I just wasn't sure how and why. And I've another, another image I've been looking at for a long time and, and another character that seems um, like it can speak to the present moment. Uh, and you can all read that and try to figure out who you think that might be. Um, and this is a Chinese porcelain export bowl. I think it's in Colonial Williamsburg's collection that uh, depicts um, John Wilkes. But I like the part, he spent much of his early co career twitting John Stewart. <laughs> twitting John Stewart. I don't know. It's crazy. So revolution makes for um, some unlikely heroes. And um, I decided to transform that into uh, a, a political portrait of Trump. And it has several variations. This is the first piece, uh, Republican Party. And um, this is a Michigan State University Museum. But the idea of, of connecting what, um, what these objects have to say to our present moment, I think, is very important in museum field and material culture and um, in almost every discipline, uh, anthropology, archaeology, um, academia, because we only experience these things through our present moment. So we don't have any idea of this object except for the, the time that we're experiencing it. And um, to bring it into why it's not something from the distant past or something that you have no connection to, there's always a connection. And it's kind of uncanny that Wilkes's number 45 was the infamous paper where he uh, was finally arrested for libel against, uh, you know, uh, naming King George. I mean, insulting the king. And we have Trump as number 45. I just think that's wild. But anyway, this is the interior of the punch bowl. This is also in a private collection here in New York. Well, I think it's in New York. <laughs> oh, I like it. No collusion, rigged witch hunt. You know, <laughs> um, but the idea of finding something that you don't know what that thing is and what it means and why it, you know, uh, and something that could be, you know, under your feet for, you know, or under humanity's feet, been lost to time and, and, and resurfaces. Uh, in the 18th century, when they were uh, unearthing some excavation of dinosaurs and fossils, uh, it became a, you know, a, 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 rightly so, a, uh, a mania about fossils and, and and that translated into the ceramics of the day. And this wonderful Staffordshire salt glaze enamel painted teapot uh, is 18th century uh, enamel painter that's working in a pottery's depiction of fossilized imagery. What a great object, right? So that's in the, I think that's in the Chipstone collection. Um, but I also found that object to be very connected to um, what we're experiencing today. Um, this is my fossil teapot, um, and this is uh, using that, that reference uh, to sort of create an imagined fossil of the future that gets unearthed from our present moment and the kind of decisions that we make in our present moment um, and what that might lead to. So um, that's another view of it. That's in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in, in Richmond. So Wedgwood looked to that, that unearthing of um, ancient relics for his inspiration. And 
was in fact not not on the Chinese porcelain train, and looked to antiquity to, for inspiration and to uh, to to set himself above and beyond, you know, uh, what many of the potteries uh, of Britain and Europe were aspiring towards. And so you have the Portland base, and then and then Wedgwood's pretty good version there. The study of, of the you know the ruin the ruins and that uh, again was a very um, significant um, influence on the the intellectuals of the time and and uh, into science and into to exploring antiquity and. Here, Wedgwood again uses that to create the, the ruined column base, which really is a, a, a great piece of sculpture. It's the ruin of Roman civilization in this sort of jasper ware um, material that he's formulated and spent, you know, uh, two, 200 or, you know, t trials of whatever to, to create the formula. I used uh, a formula that was from a Wedgwood, a, a set of formulas that may have belonged to Wedgwood at some point, and I used a Jasperware formula um, to try to see if I could recreate it. And it, it was really challenging to try to get um, the materials that were listed to figure out what they were exactly and what form. Um, and I was a part of an exhibition, Blue, White, and Radical, after 9-11 uh, um, at Garth Clark Gallery, which used to be here in New York. And <clears throat> I, did, I wanted to use um, that material, that Jasperware material, because through all my testings, I realized that it was a very, it was a very fragile and very uh, uh, hard material. So. It, it would not bend, it would only break, but it was also as hard as stone. And I uh, created this piece from, from that exploration, uh, for that exhibition. There's two other um, versions of blue and white in that group of pieces I did. One's at the New York Historical Society, and one's up here in New York somewhere. So the inspiration for this piece, again, is something that um, doesn't have to be <laughs> explained. But the material and the methodology and um, the consideration that makes this piece and the pieces that were made for the abolitionist movement by Wedgwood uh, such an icon and a, a great piece of art that speaks to that period, that subject, despite all the various things that might be um, in, at some point inappropriate or unwelcome about it. This is Kara Walker's um, piece, an early piece in 2009, and Kara Walker does, she's a, a American black artist who does, started doing silhouettes. You probably mostly all know who she is, and she's done other giant sculptural things as well. But whether or not she was, I'm sure, consciously aware of this piece, but whether or not it consciously was influenced this piece, I don't know, but it, it just struck me as being so um, important uh, to that that imagery carries something um, that we all can experience for looking at it and knowing what the depth of what that, that's saying. Uh, there's a whole genre of these abolitionist ceramics that are being produced in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, that's another subject of one of the ceramics in America in 2002, I think, or maybe 2003. And um, that material has influenced a, a body of work that I've, that's ongoing for me. But um, 
this is one of the early pieces uh, that's in the Chipstone Foundation collection where I began to use that imagery um, of the abolitionist movement and the idea of that um, to speak to the slavery in the 20, 20th and 21st century, child soldiering and child slavery, and using oversized uh, diamond and jewel ads from public, you know, and uh, these images of child soldiers in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, the shell stand has shell bullets and, and shells and uh, the, the imagery really came from the juxtaposition of luxury ads to the harshest uh, stories of the day in the front pages of the New York Times. They don't do that quite that way anymore. But, but these um, abolitionist pieces uh, sometimes uh, are, are pieces that are, you're not sure whether they're intended to be Derogatory, uh, obviously, in uh, Pesson's case, uh, you know, it's heralding this person. This was this piece, uh, the Toussaint Louverture bust. Um, some thinking is that the, you know, the over caricaturized features of the African general may be, you know, not depicting the person in. It may be a derogatory depiction of that person, but that piece was created for the abolitionist um, movement. And the abolitionist movement is a is a woman's movement in a lot of ways because there all the with the regard to the ceramics being produced for the abolitionist movement, it's all the household ceramics, the tea wares, the sugar bowls. This is uh, images of the slave ship. Uh, oh, I forget which one. The Brooks. Um, and how the, the human cargo of those ships were stored. But I, I don't think that, I think we often think about looking at the past for how the past is being miscommunicated and misinterpreted, I mean interpreted. But the present is not communicated and not um, seen. And this is an African prison uh, in you know, 2000 or 2005 or something like that. And the images of, of those two things uh, tell you that there's, no, there's, there's nothing in the past about that in many ways. Uh, this is a piece uh, actually um, in a collection up here in New York. And um, another one of those series on child soldiering and child slavery. That's a sort of a large chug. <laughs> so when the, when Colin Kaepernick and uh, many of his um, teammates there took their knee, um, I could not believe what I was seeing happen and what a, an incredible moment in history that was. And I, came to, you know, immediately recognize that connection, maybe because I have worked so much with this material. And I have no idea whether um, any of the people taking their knee there have any idea of this history, of this object, or this image, or whatever. Um, but I was almost stunned to, to then come to see how, um, how how the reaction to that was so outside of what it seemed to me. I mean, that seemed like, like a very significant historical moment happening in America today that uh, you just had, had the privilege to witness. And it, was, it just evoked all kinds of you know, venom and, and Whatever and whether or not those um, those men had any conscious connection, whether however they came to do that, and you know, as as you do things, sometimes you don't know you don't know why you're doing it or what 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 you're doing it may cause. Um, but it certainly 
seemed to me that that, um, that act was, was connected to a huge history that is still very present in this moment. Um, so as I was saying, the, the sugar bowls with uh, not made by slaves, the, the small um, jewel-like medallions, uh, a lot of materials were being produced for um, households and tables to communicate and advocate for the abolition of slavery through, the through commodity, through the material culture. Uh, this is a page of, this is how I put together a page of imagery that I've gotten uh, ready to, to get put in, made into ceramic transfer decals. They get, end up getting applied and then fired. But just that page of images. And here you have a sugar bowl that's saying if you, you know, uh, buy six uh, pounds of sugar uh, from East instead of West India, that's one less slave. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty specific formula there for um, stopping that horrific and egregious practice. So I, I think, uh, despite however anyone might feel, I, I found what this person did uh, was a huge sacrifice for himself, uh, not the sacrifice that maybe somebody takes when they um, go to war and might be, might be killed, but um, certainly sacrifice a career of, a, you know, a, as a pro football player, you, you know that's your life. And so I did this piece called Patriot Jug um, to, to document that. This uh, image uh, of a, a female kneeling, kneeling slave comes from a, a pin cushion that's in, I think, the Liverpool Museum of Art. And that's, that's an incredible um, object, you know, a very intimate object that a woman would wear every day to remind her of this, you know, uh, egregious practice that's, that's a, you know, afflicting society. And this is the Nike equality on the other side. So the idea that uh, slavery is something from the past, I feel is something that needs to be uh, exposed because there's so much that cuts through generations that's still here. This series of skulls uh, is called Colored Skulls. These are, um, I did an exhibition at Wilton House Museum in uh, Richmond, Virginia. It's a, a Virginia plantation house on the James River. And these were installed in the master bedroom, the master's bedroom, the back bedroom of the house. These are cast in porcelains that are made for the doll industries that are porcelains to depict different skin colors. So they might have Cameroon or Creole or uh, Desert Beige. These are the names of these, uh, these commercially produced slips to make China dolls. Um, and so I, I wanted to use those to do a series of these skulls. Um, the, the back stairwell connected the master bedroom to the child's bedroom. And the, the slaves that uh, were in the household, serve, serving in the household, were really um, intimately involved with the family. And I think that, that, uh, that, that they would be going up and down these back stairs to care for um, the children, to be in the most private spaces of the house, and um, that relationship, I think, is um, and under subjugation at the same time. I think that's a, a very uh, powerful and not an unpacked enough situation where they would be trusted with their own children, yet under that kind of inhumanity. 
at the time I did a, an artist residency at the North Carolina, I mean, at Starworks, it's in the Seagrove area of North Carolina. And before that I did uh, a residency in Richmond just before that, that ended up at uh, doing the work for the Wilton show. And these are some impressions off the street of Richmond for the water mains and gas mains that um, I wanted to use to create a, a series of water bottles. This was during the Flint, when the Flint uh, crisis was going on at that time while I was doing my residency. And so I was using indigenous materials in that area and the, um, also the, the traditional firings. This is a groundhog kiln, a wood-fired groundhog kiln in Seagrove. This is Chad Brown, he's a generational Seagrove potter. Um, to fire these vessels that I dug, dug the clay, the Catawba Valley type clay and used wood ash to make a uh, glaze from, from wood ash that was burned in previous kilns and, and all that kind of stuff. And this is doing a wood firing. The, the, the groundhog kiln is a day, day long fire, 24 hour firing. So you, you stoke it for 24 hours. And this one we did some salt, it's a salt kiln. And this is a beautiful shot that Rob took, my partner Rob Hunter's photography. Uh, when you put the salt in, all the uh, plumes come from the from the top, and it it it's a little toxic, yes, but <laughs> it it can't really hold a candle to <laughs> anything that's out there. Um, but it was it was an amazing experience to go and work with these uh, wood fire artists in this area. There's about a hundred. There's over a hundred potters in this area in North Carolina. It's a very unusual. You know, Britain, there's a huge ceramic footprint, but we don't really have that here in America. And there are, um, there's probably no other place in America like this. So if you get a chance to go to Seagrove, there's some, there's some great things there to see. And this is the piece, um, or detail of the piece as it came out, which is sort of in the form of, of the German uh, stoneware bottles that are ubiquitous on all colonial American sites. Um, this is a, maybe a fancier one. Another North Carolina uh, potting tradition of the Moravian uh, ceramics who are in Winston-Salem um, created these among many, many other, you know, mat, uh, great slipwares and these figural bottles. And <clears throat> I did some work on rediscovering the process of how these pieces were made. I'm just not going to talk about that very much. But um, what I will say is when you look at these people, these pieces, and somebody said, well, they were made in a mold. And, but you have to have something to take a mold from. So you have to make the, the piece that the mold is taken from. And that's where I always start as a step back from there. So the piece that you see in the mold there is demolding um, a cast piece, but I had to make an original model that that plaster mold could be made off of in all the various little parts. And then here is it being put together. And then... <laughs> we needed something 20th century, I think uh, 21st century to... to um, distinguish this from the period pieces. And I had just the thing hanging around in my studio. So um, this is my Second Amendment squirrel. Uh, there's a couple of them out there. But it started this sort of little green army. So they're, they're different versions of this. And there's sort of a you know animal farm uh, twist to these pieces. So I like that I like the, to use all the rigor of the process, the, the original historical context of those things, and, and then try to, you know, use some sweat to get them there to then speak to that, our moment, um, to really try to connect them. Uh, when I was doing the residency at Seagrove, the HB2 law was um, in the, was being passed uh, and had not been challenged yet. And I don't, if you don't know what the HB2 law was, is, it was to that um, basically uh, legislation of uh, 
transgender people presenting, uh, using their, the bathroom of their birth uh, sex and then having to identify uh, that. And it was really just a, a, a tool to intimidate, you know, the transgender community, the LGBTQ community into um, bringing some kind of legislation up that, get, that got people Uh, focused on a, on a contorted and strange aspect of what really needs to be addressed there in a, in a negative way. So I decided to do an oversized version of my um, North Carolina squirrels to speak to that issue because this was all, this all was, began in North Carolina, the HB2 law, and it, it was pretty um, intense there about that. This is Ben Owen III. He's a, a, a master uh, wood fire, a salt glaze artist, and his great grandfather uh, is probably one of the most well known uh, Seagrove potters, North Carolina potters. And he let me put my dumb things in his kiln. <laughs> this man makes the most incredibly beautiful, you know, huge. And probably, I don't think any of these pots are him. The other thing about these wood firings, I'll just say, is they are a communal effort. You have to have a crew, uh, Ben's kiln and some other, uh, David's kiln that I usually do. That's a five-day, 24-hour day stoking of those kilns to fire these pieces. They only happen once or twice a year, and there's a lot committed to each kiln. These are the, uh, these are the finished products, which were also, um, they were salt, salt wood fired. And they're in the Mint Museum um, uptown. So these bottles have become kind of a, a, a venue for me to, to describe some social issues. How are we? Uh, are we long on time? I'm sorry. I'll, I will speed up. Everybody probably recognizes these German stoneware, 17th century bottles with the funny little masked man who no one, everybody has different uh, ideas about what that person is, who they are, and why they're on there, but um, no one really knows. But I wanted to use that form and that, <laughs> that sort of ubiquitous mask, male mask, to transform um, those stoneware bottles to um, probably the most iconic 21st century female, <laughs> which is no longer Liberty, it's st the Starbucks Mermaid. Um, and the Starbucks Mermaid has some history. Uh, this is a 16th century engraving of, of what that really came from. You can see this, this mermaid sort of spread eagle here. That Starbucks actually had to, to um, cut the bottom half off of this thing because they were getting some flack, but it, it's kind of a you know, pretty misogynistic image in a lot of ways. And um, that's basically still their, their logo today because um, her arms are holding the two split tails there, as you can see. But there is no three-dimensional Starbucks mermaid face, so I had to uh, use some digital, um, get some 3D imaging of that done so that then I could get a 3D print of that made and then I could take the 3D print and take a mold off a 3D print to get a, um, a something I could push clay into and use as a three-dimensional depiction of that. And so these are my Me Too bottles and the, and the one in the front is a witch bottle. That's the detail of those. But I think that that movement and that, you know, that idea that um, we can, you know, try to speak some truth to power. I think it would be equally advantageous, if not a lot more, if there was some power speaking some truth. But, um, you know, that, that, that did... Um, bring some hope in 2018 when we had the first two Native American women elected to Congress. 
And I just wanted to mention quickly an uh, upcoming um, project that I'm working on in Plymouth, Massachusetts, uh, about the 2020 Mayflower. This is a, a ritual site, the Split Rock in um, Plymouth, and of course the Plymouth Rock, the 1620 Rock. But that's um, uh, curated by Glenn Adamson, who some of you may know. It's going to be at the Fuller Craft Museum, and it's a sister city thing with the Pl with the box in Plymouth, UK, and Plymouth College of Art. And it's 10 contemporary artists trying to unpack that subject matter a little bit, especially with regard to um, indigenous peoples, First Nation peoples. And I'll just, this is David Stumfley in the back. One of the premises of this is to work in Six, late 16th, early 17th century technologies and not use modern technologies, which is impossible. But I tried to focus on uh, doing a wood firing. Uh, this is David Stumfley in the background, his wood fire kiln, and, and I'll be working with um, uh, him. That's a couple of pieces coming out of the kiln to come. The last thing is a project that we've been trying to do for some time and just are about to complete. And that is, it was a subject of the 2007 Ceramics in America making of a Bon Mars pickle stand. And what I'll say about uh, that is the form, the, the communication of ideals through ceramics is not always narrative or pictorial or whatever. In this case, it is actually embodied in this object, in this, in this American porcelain tripartite pickle stand that was used on the tables of um, the uh, Patriots of the Revolutionary War at Philadelphia in 1770, uh, Bon and Morris established a, the first porcelain manufacturer in Philadelphia, you know, in the midst of uh, the lead up to the American Revolution. So this piece means something. It was designed a certain way. I won't go into it now, but it will be the subject of this little video that we're doing. This is um, Joran uh, Hood, who's the videographer. And his father, Graham Hood, was, wrote the definitive uh, material on the excavation of finding the original Bonnemar site in Philadelphia. So that kind of came full circle. And I'll just show this little teaser. <laughs> So the work I've done um, since 2007 when I was asked by Rob to kind of uncover how this object was made and all that would be revealed in the, in the, the film and of course the journal of 2007 if you want to read about it, um, has again informed you know, uh, a series of contemporary works. And I'll just go through them quickly. This, this one, uh, of course, you see again the shells, the bullet shells, and the sh fossilized um, sort of shell. This is in the Carnegie Museum, made in China. 
And this is in, um, at Washington Lee University in the Reeves Collection of ceramics. And again, a, a way of taking uh, all that background work to be able to recreate that piece uh, with all that inte physical integrity to then speak to um, the, the idea of, uh, in this case, of uh, the loss of manufacturing, the ch you know, China trade in the 20th century and 21st century and, and how that's affected. So this is called American Pickle. But maybe most um, poignantly, this uh, pickle stand, black and white pickle, um, which I did in 2014, kind of sank home uh, yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday, during we had a, a huge uh, rally of, um, gun, well, I would call them, <laughs> I don't know, Gun activists, um, you know, weapon carrying, a lot of weapon carrying white people in the uh, capital of Richmond yesterday. Um, and so I think it's important, you know, I think it's important for artists to also speak out about things that are going on in our contemporary culture. And though I might seem like an ambulance chaser in this case, I actually, I actually predated the the Sun Times here <laughs> with mugs it. I couldn't believe it. I had this piece in the kiln. <laughs> I was compelled. I was doing some uh, women Mary. I was doing some reproductions of this piece, and um, for a client, and um, I just I needed to do that. And uh, the next day, Rob sends me this picture of mugs it. So. <laughs> That's the shrug emoji, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Make sure you pay attention to Ceramics in America. It's an incredible publication, and everything I've talked about tonight, um, you, can, you can really glean so much more from uh, this publication. So it's an annual journal edited by Robert Hunter, published by the Chipstone Foundation. And this is the 2018 is issue, which is the most recent one. And it does have an article on my work in it that Rob wrote. So on uh, the last drop pot project. So thank you guys. Sure. I mean, if there's time. Yeah, if there's time Does for a few questions. Does anybody have questions? No? Yeah. Your, um, your name is Sterling. Yes. Now, some of them are very, very large. But this one that was to scale of the original, yeah. So the green ones are to the scale, and the only big ones I, I did were the ones with the, um, uh, you know, the symbols that are in the Mint Museum, the gender symbols. Anybody? Hi. <laughs> I will never tell. <laughs> I was, they were doing a restoration on this piece. Um, was it Lucy Ray or this piece of the V&A? I don't remember who the artist was. And they had it in a vault because it had some uranium in the glass. <laughs> you had to go in with gloves and stuff. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I can't get a hold of that stuff. Can you? <laughs> Anybody? Yes. Uh, I'm curious as in your time doing such an intense review and then doing this collection, um, to what extent do you view the conservation work as a position that you guys uh, have before now? Yeah. It played big, and I didn't include any of that. I just do too much stuff. To um, but at the v and I did. I worked really closely with one of the conservationists there, and she introduced me to this silicon putty that I'm now, you know, that it became an addiction. Um, and I had I worked with Nike. Uh, I was doing a thing with uh, pattern and the proliferation of pattern, specifically on 18th century white salt glaze stonewares because there's a huge amount of technology in those different patterns they were using. And I wanted to connect that up to a 21st century um, commodity that incorporates all those patterns. And, and so I 
realize it's tennis shoes. It's, you know, there's like 20 different patterns on one pair of tennis shoes of all these different materials and whatever. So, uh, and it, the Olympics were going on while I was there. So anyway, I reached out, I was able to reach out to Nike because we have a friend who works for Nike and see if they would, um, you know, bring me some Olympic trainers, which they did. And it's super cool. If you go on anything I have online, you can see that. But I didn't want to destroy them by trying to take molds off of them and stuff. And so I got with the conservator and she introduced me to this stuff. And I was like, oh, that's cool. So it, it, it just releases, you know, very cleanly, of course, away from that. But the, the more um, addictive thing about it is it will release from clay which is not usually the case. So you can put some clay sprig molds directly in that silicon porcelain and get it to come out. It's not quite as easy as all that, but it, um, and I had dug some, I gotten some London clay coming out of excavation, uh, some construction sites around there. And it particularly um, was a great material to use with that. And then I went down, we worked on some projects. They had a they did the, the great Meissen porcelain fountain, and they were trying to, to um, decide whether the, I should maybe try to uh, model some of the parts they needed. Um, I had talked about, you know, maybe they should get it 3D modeled and printed, or, you know, or maybe do both to show the, you know, the difference between those things. And they did end up, uh, I think they did end up getting them 3D modeled and printed and then cast. I haven't seen it in person, but I... I think it's a pretty amazing installation now. I used to go see it all in parts in the cases. So, yeah. The Colin Kaepernick wall, is mm -hmm. it something that, you know, we use with our, in our teaching for people in black community and we use it in the teaching? Well, when I think about the power of the, that object, that then it becomes something that can be seen by children in the New York City public school system, for example. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about trying to outreach to some sort of indigenous objects as a way to teach history and sort of better understand that? I do like to try to get um, pieces like that into a pub. I mean, and in fact, um, a lot of times, like that mug, somebody, uh, Rob took a picture of the, uh, the royal mug, the mugs it mug, and somebody was like, where can I get one of those? And I'm like, there is only one of those. And knowing me, there will only be one of those, which is, you know, sometimes a problem. But I like to try to get pieces like that in a, it, to the Kaepernick jug or the, it took me a long time to get the squirrels to the Mint Museum in North Carolina. I wanted them to be in North Carolina. I wanted them to be in a place where a lot of people go in, which they do in that, because the uptown you know, they get all kinds of people coming in there. But I think you're right. I think it's not it's not enough. Um, I mean, hopefully the museum's outreach are getting school kids to see those kinds of objects. But I like to try to place those objects in public venues if I can, you know, because uh, it really does make a difference. Or make sure anytime I sell something to someone that they're willing to loan it to that. But I did do a project, another thing I didn't show, about um, engaging uh, a lot of school. I did the, the residency, I did the Visual Arts Center. Uh, I did a, a giant face jug on the African, the slave-made, you know, uh, um, South Carolina face jugs. Um, but a big one, and I used those skin-colored slips for people to come in. They were all laid out, you know, because lots of people came through that place with all kinds of different disciplines and, and things that it's a pretty vital little art center in Richmond there. And there's every community is involved in it in a different way. And anyway, to have people put their hands in the different skin colored slips and put their handprints on the jug, you know, more and more and more and more. And so they ended up getting hundreds and hundreds of handprints on the jug and then uh, in these in these slips. And it was lots of different kid groups and uh, dis disabled, some veterans groups, you know, and I would talk about that in the process. So that's, you know, a, a real time way of not only letting them see, but actually physically experience and be a part of, and for me to have the honor of having all, you know, all those hands to a piece. It was a, really a great um, thing to be able to do. It's it's hard to make those things happen. You know, you you know, you have to um, 
but there are a lot of artists working that way uh, or trying to work that way. But there, there could be some things done. One of the main things I did not say about um, the Kaepernick jug, the jug that I put that on, I created for um, to, to understand the process of those thrown lathe turned uh, creamware and pearlware jugs, the patriotic jugs that were this, uh, you know, uh, the Robert Teitelman collection had probably one of the biggest collections of those uh, pieces in the world. He was writing a book on it. He wanted me to, to make one to see. And so I've saved that piece for many years because uh, that was several years ago. But the Liverpool jugs that were being you know, brought over on those ships were uh, the same ships where slaves were being brought over by the thousands. So, I mean, Liverpool being one of the largest slave trading um, cities in the, in the world at that time. So uh, the connection with the jug is not just, um, you know, unconnected to uh, the context of what those jugs were, you know, uh, success to trade, for instance. When you, when you think about what they might be talking about, you see success to trade, oh yeah, um, that's a pretty cynical statement um, when you think about it in terms of trade being uh, human beings. So um, I think, you know, it is important for, for kids to be able to be exposed to that, that kind of historical art in particular because it gives them a sense of the meaning of that history now. Um, and I think that's helpful um, in, to have more awareness of where things are coming from, that they don't drop out of the sky. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, um, I mean, one of the reasons, not, I don't know if it's one of the reasons, but one, one thing I've always done is figure out a way to recreate that piece so convincingly in, in whatever way I needed it to be convincing. Um, to not do that, not necessarily to not do it because I didn't want to, um, you know, uh, take liberties with an artifact that may have significance, but also because... Uh, even if I could just buy something like that to make something with, um, it wouldn't really tell me anything about that thing from its physical, you know, its physical being. I chose, uh, like I did a pair of white salt glaze plates, um, and I chose the antique for, for that because I felt like the, the imagery and the purpose of it it had to be, it, it couldn't be something I made. So uh, in, in, that, in that case, it was something that, you know, Rob had picked up at a Chelsea flea market some years ago, a couple of little, you know, um, white salt glaze English 18th century plates. And um, I just felt like they were not uh, diminished by what I did to them. They they it kept their integrity. Now, p artists like Paul Scott, he uses all, you know, all um, period stuff. And so there's a, you know, there's a discussion to be had about that. I'm not, I'm pretty, um, I feel like I'm pretty self-policing in that way. Like I kind of know what, what things are and I don't, um, I don't think it's good to necessarily, um, take those things and uh, keep them from informing the present about their own context and, you know, if they're unique to that. There's just some things that are so not unique, like what Paul uses, they, they just throw those things away by the, you know, by the, uh, Claire Toomey, you know, she did the big giant pile of discarded um, Staffordshire wares. Uh, my uh, colleague and friend Don Carpentier went to Spode to try to uh, rescue these warehouses of their their molds, their tools, their material. You know, there's these things uh, because they were going to go to the trash heap. So, you know, it's a complicated 
subject, but um, what do you think about it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it could be scary if, especially, like, that's why I say I'm self-policing because I've been working with this material for a long time. But, you know, somebody like Ruby Sterling might come along and say, hey, let's take all this old stuff, and he's probably got enough money to buy some really, you know, important things and put them together and maybe fire them up, and I'll be like, all right, you go, dude. No, I don't care. I mean, it's not that I don't care. I just don't, um, I don't feel like I sh need to weigh in on that you know I feel like what what people do sometimes is not you know not okay with me but in the end it may be important that it happened and it did if it did happen it happened what are you gonna you know what can you do about it so um yeah I just uh don't in fact I have a piece right now I've been struggling with that for about eight months now of a big salt glaze charger that I wanted to do and I acquired it for that purpose but it's pretty unique and I think I've decided that I'm just not going to do that to that piece <laughs> yeah <laughs> which Rob is glad to hear <laughs> well, thank you so much Michelle. thank you